Um, the Gospel of John, <laughs> chapter 4, starting at verse 1. If you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say amen. Slow, slow down. Slow down real quick. I'm, I'm searching. Verse 1, verse 1, and it reads like this. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Verse 7. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Brothers and sisters, if you will bear with me for a few moments, I want to preach from the title of The Theology of Thirst. The Theology of Thirst. You may take your seat. You may take your seat in the presence of God. Amen. And while you take your seat, can you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you thirsty. But it's cool. They felt some type of way about that. Look at your other neighbor. They, they, you, you talk to the one with the attitude. Look at your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, you thirsty, but it's cool because Jesus was thirsty too. Ah, uh, so many of us, many of us, when we hear the word thirsty, we think of, we have a whole different definition of thirsty. We, we, we automatically zoom in on the carnal and the, the sinful version of thirsty. But how many of you know that thirsty is a state that is natural and to be thirsty is also spiritual? The definition of thirsty is to be overly eager or to long for something desperately. So being thirsty is natural because all of us need water, amen? Our body is 61% water, so that means over half of what makes up who you are is dependent on what you drink. And being thirsty is also spiritual because I believe we all have a thirst within our soul to know God, to be with God, and to be in his presence. David said in the psalm, uh, chapter 42, verse 1, he says, As a deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul for you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So next time you talk to your neighbor, they shouldn't get an attitude when you say, you thirsty. Because we all thirsty in the building. We are thirsty for more of God. But here's my issue today. Many of us, we have thirst issues. We have issues with our thirst. The first, the first issue we have is many of us are thirsty, but we don't truly understand what we are thirsty for. I believe that many of us are living our lives operating off of misguided thirst. We think we know what we need, we think we know what we want, and we think we know what will give us what we want. So we pursue that thing, we get in a relationship with that person, we go after that goal because we're so sure that it will satisfy us, it'll satisfy our thirst for fulfillment, but in the end, we find out, like Ecclesiastes says, it's just like chasing the wind. We end up thirsty and empty in the end. Here's the, here's the thirst issue number two. Many of us are thirsty, but we looking for water in all the wrong places. Hello, hello. We looking for water in all the wrong places. So when you're truly thirsty, when you're tired, when you're weary, you're dehydrated, you don't run into the kitchen and grab a glass of Kool-Aid. When you're really thirsty, when you really need something to satisfy your thirst, you don't run and grab a Coke or a Pepsi. You need some water, amen? You want some water. You, I don't care if you, if you like Kool-Aid, the cherry kind. You need some water because water is the best thing that will satisfy your thirst. And the problem with many of us is we are sipping from a bad source. Many of us, we thirsty and we're sipping from what we think is a well, 
when it's really a thirst trap. See, the world offers us so many things that claim that they will satisfy us, that claims that they will quench our thirst for fulfillment. This will give you peace. This will make you happy. This will make you have peace in your life. But really, everything that we find and pursue in this world leaves us still thirsty in the end. I just want to spend a few moments today and show you what happens when thirsty people encounter the true and living Savior. Amen? Let's go back to the scripture. Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 1, John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, he left Judea and departed again from Galilee. So at this point in Jesus' ministry, he is he's saving people, he's healing people, he's preaching the word of God, and a lot of the church leaders are starting to hate on Jesus because his ministry is bad for business. The Pharisees were supposed to be the, the mouthpieces of God for the world. They're supposed to know the Bible left and right, but here it is, this, this Jesus. His ministry is on and popping, and now they're jealous of him. And he heard that they heard that his ministry was growing. But Jesus was on a mission. He said, we got to leave Judea, and I got to go. Verse 4 says, he had to pass through Samaria. That's odd, because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. It was tradition that if you were a Jew and you had to go somewhere and you had to pass through Samaria, go ahead and take the long way because, you know, we don't mess with the Samaritans. The Samaritans think they know God. The Samaritans think they're a part of the, the, the nation of Israel, but they're really not. So let's go ahead and pass around and not even mess with those people. But Jesus, when he's on a mission, he doesn't care who you are. It said he had to pass through Samaria. It says that he was on purpose to pass through Samaria. Verse 5, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus from his journey was weary, and he was thirsty, so he sat beside the well. Verse 7, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, I just told you that the Samaritans and the Jews, they don't really mess with each other, right? So it was kind of odd that Jesus would ask her for a drink. Let's see how she responds in verse 9. It says, the Samaritan woman said to him, uh, how is it that you, hold on, hold on, pause, pause. Fellas, if you ever about to get into an argument with a woman, there's certain phrases that if they start out the argument with it, you about to get this work. This is one of the phrases. If, if she starts the argument with so... How is it that, I, I just, you know, I just think it's funny that you, no, you know, help me, help, no, help me understand. How is it that you, so she had an attitude with Jesus. Jesus is thirsty. He said, girl, can I just have some water? But because he was a Jew and her being a Samaritan, she got an attitude. Let's see what happens. Verse 9, it says, so how is it that you, a Jew, Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. And it says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So let me, let me go ahead and highlight this right here because Jesus, after this, he exposes two dangers of misguided thirst. Two dangers of misguided thirst. So she, she got an attitude with Jesus, but how many of you know that when Jesus wants to have an encounter with you, he don't mind wrestling with you. He don't mind taking his time. He don't mind being patient. A lot of us need to thank God he didn't give up on the first time he tried to reach us because we had an attitude. We just knew we was in the right, but he kept on pursuing us. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you only knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying this to you, first of all, you wouldn't have an attitude. Second of all, you would be asking me for a drink. Because if you would have asked me, I would have given you living water. Here's the first danger of misguided thirst. You can be indulging so much in the wrong water that when the real water is presented to you, you don't even recognize it. Jesus is like, hold up. If you only knew who you were talking to, and if you only knew the water that I could give you, 
your attitude would be a little bit more short. The second danger of misguided thirst is that the world can have us so trapped that we can miss out on what Jesus has to offer us. I can look back over my life and I can think of so many times that if I would have just listened to the word of God, if I would have listened to who was trying to tell me the truth of God, I wouldn't have missed out on some things. I wouldn't have made the same mistakes. I wouldn't have got with that person. I wouldn't have, hello, if I would have just listened and got the word of God, but the world can have us so trapped because here's the issue. A problem with a lot of us is we believe that what we're drinking from is better than what God has to offer us. We think what we're indulging is, in is better than what God is offering us. So he's offering living water, and you're like, okay, no, I'm cool with this uh, petty water. I'm cool with this addiction water. I'm cool with this anger water. I'm cool with this resentment water because it's been helping me deal with my issues. I know what you have, but Jesus, I'm going to do this how I want to do it. But in verse 14, verse 13, actually, Jesus says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, the water that you came to get, will thirst again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. The water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus meets this thirsty woman and he sees the life that she's living. He sees that she keeps coming back to the same well and filling up with the same water and leaving exactly the same. And she'll be thirsty again and come back. It's a cycle of life. But he says, I have living water and you will never thirst again. So here, here a lot of us get to this point. God sees us. He offers the living water and we say, OK, I'll take that. I want that. How I'm living is, is, is bad, it's a cycle. Okay, I own up to that. And then like she said in verse 15, the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come to draw again. But here's the issue. Jesus offers us living water, but it comes with a cost. Yeah, there's a cost to living water. There's a cost. Let's look at verse 16. Verse 16, the first cost is you must be willing to expose what's in your cup. So when she came to the well, she was already carrying some stuff. She already had some stuff in her cup before Jesus offered the living water. And you got to be willing to expose your cup. Let's look at verse 16. Jesus says to her, okay, so you want this living water. Okay, go call your husband and, and, and come back and I'll give you this water. And the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right. I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have right now is not your husband what you have said is right so here's the issue we love it when Jesus offers us good stuff but when it's time for us to be honest about who we are when he starts to expose some stuff when he starts to show us who we really are in the deeper parts of ourselves, it gets uncomfortable when it's time to get some living water. The cost of exposing ourselves turns a lot of people away. Lord, just give me the living water. Bless me indeed. Give me the, give me the abundant life and peace, but don't, don't get all in my business. Don't, don't expose my darkness. Just give me your living water. But how many of you know that he can't fill you with living water when you're full of yourself? <laughs> When you're full of the things of this world, you don't even have room to receive his living water. That's the first cost. The second cost is once he exposes your cup, you must be willing to leave your cup. So now you got to let it go. It ain't enough for you to just admit, okay, I got issues. This is what I'm doing. A lot of us like to stay there where it's like, I got a problem. I'm wrong, but you don't want to give it up. We all know somebody that they embrace their wrong as their identity. This is just how I am. This happened to me, so I act like this. And it's, it's worse when you're not ignorant of why you acting dysfunctional. You might as well stayed ignorant and been wrong, but now that you know why you crazy, why you still crazy? You know why you mad all the time, but you still cussing at people. 
you know why you don't trust anybody, but you still don't get any relationships with anybody. When Jesus exposes what's in our cup, it's not to put all our dirty laundry in the streets because you know what? A lot of us read that verse when he said, you got five husbands and the one you with ain't your husband and automatically started judging. See, church people, they, they, they'll, see you, they'll see your past. That's, a, that's a re, one reason why a lot of people don't like to expose and what's in their cup because if I expose it, will you still love me? If I expose it, will you still extend that living water? Will, will you still see me as a child of God? Will you still see us on an equal plane? I tried to expose my cup before and it was met with condemnation. So hold on, Jesus. But Jesus saw not a woman who had five ex-husbands, not a woman who may, people may have thought was promiscuous, but a woman who was suffering from broken relationships, a woman may, who may have dealt with some rejection in her life, a woman who may have be dealing with some trust issues, because after, uh, hey, with me, after the second, after the second marriage, huh, I got issues after that. I, the fifth, the sixth, that's why we shacking. I tried it five other times. Jesus, come on now. I, I, six times ain't the charm. But Jesus saw what was wrong with her, and he met her with love. He says, I see you for who you are, but I don't expose you to judge you. I expose you to save you. I expose you to change you because here's another secret. The water that he gives is not just to fill you up. The water he gives is used to wash you. The water he gives is used to baptize you. Jesus says no one is saved unless they are baptized by water. We're not talking about being dunked outside of the lobby. We're talking about being exposed and allowing his living water to wash you clean. It's a lot of people in this house that can testify when I finally exposed who I was to God and I finally gave it to him. Not only did he fill me up, but he cleaned me up. And now I'm changed. I don't talk the way I used to. I don't walk the way I used to. I don't hang with who I used to. I am definitely a new creature. I used to be bad and bougie, but now I'm saved and bougie. This is how you know you saved and bougie. Maybe you like me. I was driving the other day, and it's, I'm, I'm weird. I'm, I'm doing this thing where, like, a love song will come on, but I'll turn it into a worship song. I'm the only one that does that. Okay, let's go. I'm going to give you an example. So I was driving the other day, and a love song came on, and I, was, I'm, I must have been in the Holy Ghost. I was like, hmm, okay. My whole life has changed since you came in. Thank you, Lord. I knew back then you were that special one. Oh, I'm so in love, so deep in love. You made my life complete. Thank you, Jesus. Ha. You are so sweet. <laughs> I was worshiping the genuine. Like, what? I got some old school saints in the house. Let me, let me switch it up on them. If this world were mine, I would place at your feet all that I own. You've been so good to me. Hey, oh, Jesus. If this world were mine. I can't hit that note. <laughs> you know you changed when you... Whenever love is mentioned, you got to talk about God. Whenever com being complete in your life is mentioned, I have to be talking about Jesus whenever I'm talking about having peace in my mind. I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about the Jesus that I met. You can't talk about love without talking about my God. Because not only did he fill me up, but he washed me. We're getting deep into the theology right now. I'm almost done, y'all. Pastor's gone. I'm not going to preach long. So let's see what happens in verse 25. Verse 25, the woman still has a slight attitude. It says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell me all things. 
So he's saying, yeah, okay, you, yeah, I don't know how you knew I had five husbands, but uh, you can't say nothing to me until Jesus comes. I know he's coming. You just some dude at the well. Don't tell me about who I am. A lot of us have this excuse that we're waiting on God. I'll get right when he answers this prayer. I'll get right when he does that or when he meets me right here. When Jesus says in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who you speak of am he. So who you waiting on is already here. I'm waiting on you. A lot of us have had enough encounters. We had enough invitations. We have enough opportunities to expose ourselves. But we say we waiting on God. When he is waiting on us, in verse 27, it says the disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking to a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? And why are you talking with her? Verse 28, the woman realized who she was talking to. She was willing to expose herself, and she stopped waiting on God. And verse 28, it says, the woman left her jar. That's the second cause. You must be willing to leave your cup. A lot of us came in here carrying stuff. A lot of us came in here with a full cup already, expecting God to give us living water when he wants you to leave your cup with him. You got to give your cup to God. And verse 28 says she left her cup and she went back into the town and she said to the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. So here's another thing that I want us to understand about the theology of thirst. You're not just exposing yourself. You're not just giving up your cup for him to fill you up and wash you and for you to keep it all to yourself. It says she was washed and full and she went back to the town and shared her experience. There are so many of us in here, we have people in our lives that if we don't share our testimony with them, they will never have an opportunity to get the living water that Christ has. Stop holding your testimony to yourself. Stop keeping your experience with Christ to yourself because a lot of you are still mad because of what God allowed you to go through, but you don't realize that you didn't go through that for you. Not everything you go through is for you. Until you start to share your testimony, you won't ever realize why you went through that. Why did I go through that painful season? Why did they leave me? Why did I have to lose that job? Why, why, why? When God is saying, start telling your story. Because there's somebody who's going through the same thing, but they don't know Jesus. There's somebody going through the same thing, but their result may be suicide. Their result may be depression. And the fact that you overcame the same thing might lead them to go to the well and find out who is it? Who is this Jesus? If you think I'm lying, go to verse 39 and it says, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Verse 40, so the Samaritans came to him and they asked him to stay with him and he stayed there two days. Verse 41, and many more believed because of this word. Verse 42 messes me up every time I read it. It says, and they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. It's no longer because of your testimony that we believe. See, we were just piggybacking off of your faith. We were just believing because of what you said. But then it says, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. You have no idea that by you holding back your testimony, you're preventing someone from having an encounter with Jesus. You think that your testimony is just for you, but if you share it, you might be giving people an opportunity to meet the Christ. Don't hold your testimony. And as I close... I'm wearing pink because last month we just celebrated Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Do we have any breast cancer survivors in the house? Do we have? Okay, it's just, okay, all right. Hello. My mother, my mother is a breast cancer survivor. And I remember in 2014 when she first got the diagnosis, the first day she got her diagnosis, I saw her break down and cry because we know and we understand how much breast cancer has ran through the women in my mama's side of the family. 
We've lost aunties. We've lost grandmothers to this. And for her, she had just lost her brother. She was dealing with a broken marriage that she had just got out of, and she was raising two sons by herself. And it was like, God, what else? Now I'm diagnosed with breast cancer? But after that first day, I didn't didn't see her cry one more tear. I saw her start to worship God in advance for the healing that she was trusting for. See, when you have when you have some faith, a lot of times it makes you look crazy. So I would be in the room like, Lord, I'm worried. You know, I'm sensitive. Lord, help my mama. But she'd be in the room praising. She'd be in the room worshiping in advance. And I'm like, Mom, what's going on? And I'll never forget the day where she was supposed to have her surgery. This was the surgery that would determine whether they could remove the cancer or if it was time to start the chemo. As she was going in, she was encouraging everybody else in a time where you would think that we would have to encourage her. She went in, she was confident, she was bold, and we sat in the waiting room and waited. A couple hours went by and the doctor came out and the doctor had tears in her eyes. And automatically my heart dropped and I was like, Lord, we can't take no more bad news, Lord. Please, please, not that, Lord. She started talking to my grandma, and my grandma started crying too. And I was like, Lord, I can't be a thug for much longer. I can't cry again. Lord, please. So I walked up to them, and what I thought was the doctor giving a bad report, it was her telling us and thanking us for bringing my mother to the hospital. She said, as we were taking her into her surgery, she was sharing her story with us. And she was preaching her faith to us. And when we thought we had to encourage her, she was encouraging us. And this is what I'm trying to tell you, that when God gives you his living water, he makes you a well. You no longer have to come to the well. You become the well. So the living water flows through you. When she was supposed to be down, when she was supposed to be crying, when she was supposed to expect the worst, she was encouraging other people. And she saved some doctors in that hospital. She brought the faith of Jesus Christ in that hospital. She was encouraging other patients going through the same thing. She said, I know what the doctor says. I know what the diagnosis says. But I remember when I met Jesus at the well and he filled me up right then and he watched me back then, so why wouldn't he do it again? I'm trusting him in advance, because I've already been through enough. I've already gotten a bad report. This is not gonna be to death. See, a lot of us in this room, we've been through too much to let a doctor's note have us shaken. We've been through too much to let when people walk away, break our spirits. I've already been through so much, and Jesus brought me through those things. So if you bring it to me, Lord, how can you speak through me? If God allows you to go through something and you have the living water, this may be just an opportunity for him to allow it to flow through you to other people. Stop complaining about the trials in your life. Stop complaining about the valleys in your life because after every valley and every trial comes a new testimony. After every new testimony comes an opportunity for people to come and experience Christ. While you putting your head down, you need to lift your head up and share your story. That might be the key for you getting out. That might be the key for your storm being over. Stop holding your story and share the water that he's given you. In Jesus' name, be saved. In Jesus' name, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.